Hello, my wonderful viewers, and welcome to the fourth episode of Dan Milano Responses, where I take a look at Dan Milano, the creator of Glitch Text, responses to the videos that I did in, in, in an analyzing Glitch Text, which is quite largely how this channel got started. So, moving on, uh, we've done season one, we did the intermission between season one and season two, and moving on to the first episode of season two, Reply to the Glitch Modder, O Me of Little Faith, Glitch Touch Season 2, Episode 1, Analysis and Review. I had really enjoyed this episode, and mainly the introduction of the character Ridley. Uh, it's been a while since I watched it. But anyway, she had a line where she didn't. She said she didn't do shoddy workmanship, and I'd commented on it. It's because I'd wondered what it means. And Dan Milano responds, "The shoddy workmanship line was a really good, in great improv line by board artist Phil Jacobson, who really intended it as just a way to convey that Ridley does quality work, and the dragon will be difficult to defeat. It came with a slight tear in one version because it was also Ridley giving the text permission to destroy something she created. Ridley does factor into future shows we've written and boarded, but have yet to animate. Along with the still yet to be revealed character, she will certainly have an impact on the world of the show." My reply was, the character of Ridley is a positive delight, by the way. She is fantastically layered. I always wince a little when her archetype shows up because it has been so commonly oversimplified, but you really fleshed her out even in this first episode. To which Milano replied, Betty Adams, so appreciate this. Working with Ash Ash Ashley Birch as a writer was a wonderful experience and she very much helped to flesh out that character to the point that we all knew she would be wonderful at doing the voice as well. Ridley appears in two of the unanimated shows we created back in 2018 and is planned to have more to do with the story for sure. Everyone is important. Moving on to the next episode, Ping, Glitch Text Season 2, Episode 2. Never mind, I wasn't using my heart just now. Go and break it anyways. Uh, Milano Soffit gave me not one, but two replies. And, oh my goodness, this this episode really did wrench your heartstrings. It's the one where uh, Five's backstory is revealed and the fact that his father was in jail was revealed. And I actually, the first response to was a very surface level question I had, why the B logo shows up so so often, the B symbology shows up so, so often in the show. To which Milano replied, Nobi the honeybee is one of Hanobi's first and most beloved characters. Like Mario, it has been around a while since, well, Bee Buzz. You will find references to Nobi in various forms throughout the entire series, starting with Age of Hanobi, in which Nobi appears as a costumed mascot. To my response, I said, yeah, nice! Yes, something like this did occur to me on the next rewatch when that van was portal dropped behind the giant billboard with no bee on it. I do have a tendency to miss the forest for the bees while I, when I'm doing analysis. Took a real bite out of my grades in uni. Milano res and then Milano responds again. Last thing, yes, the energy fields generated by gauntlets do protect augment, enhance the physics of the wear. That said, you will see evidence of us giving our characters moments of resilience and strength even when not using gauntlets. In Miko's case, she has an intense kick as a child, and in those cases, we were really just embracing the fact that half the show resides, resides squarely in Toontown. My response to that, that was, may the rule of cool reign long and mighty. Then, Dan Milano's third response was, As you say, it's hard to determine age in some of the characters, though we probably just need to use more face lines. Five da Five's dad is not as young as he appears. And this was in response to me noting that if Five's dad was as young as he appears, then it makes him a really odd timetable for tech development in the glitch text world. But Milano j just pointed out that the very real thing that age is very, very hard to draw, especially in cartoons, because age is defined by how many lines you put on the face. And for, a sm for the small size of the face in an animated cartoon, there's just not enough room to put all those lines in. Okay, now this is where Dan really started replying to some of my other commenters. So Wade Bain, uh, YouTube user Wade Bain says, Hinobi's tech suits and gear seem to be composed of hard light, which gives the wearer a form of protection even when deactivated and added protection when fully armored. In my opinion, that is what allows the techs to perform as they do and take damage along with getting in shape from all the constant exercise. My response to Wade was, that makes sense. It must have some sort of safety so it keeps working after overclocking and burnout. And Milano responds to 
Wade, such cool insight. Yes, we talked about the text as having an overshield on at all times, a concept in many games. Tracking such a thing visually in an animated show became quite complicated, so it remains the kind of concept for folks like you to consider and folks like us to eventually show or comment upon. Other non-visual, non-discussed concepts include the amount of power drains certain power-ups require, the fact that they have cooldown limits, etc. We never really even explain fully how glitches work any more than George Lucas might have described the details of droids, blasters, or lightsabers, but we try to leave enough crumbs for viewers to pick up the details. The Ridley episode allowed us a very organic way to indicate things such as the differences between legal and illegal glitch signature, or a full description of Plixels as nanotech, it's mesotech actually, and how they define their forms, etc. Anyway, it's all great fun that we try to keep semi-plausible, at least more than most cartoon shows, since we value the science and science fiction. In this episode, we confirm that Miko is 99% rough. Sometimes when making a show like this, there is a little barometer in our guts that we rel rely upon to give our notes and filter the tone of the show. We look for our team to experiment and try things when not directed otherwise, and then to filter those experiments. In a case like this episode, we could have told our artists to pull way back on the physicality we were seeing, but our respect for animation and love of cartoons absolutely would not permit it. Sometimes we just let everyone go for it. All this to say, I'm not sure I can argue over the shield was still on, but perhaps the rate of decay for the energy shield takes a few seconds after its power source has been drained. Huh. Maybe I can argue it was on. Sometimes we even surprise ourselves. And to which I replied, Sometimes I am startled to find that when there's an issue in my stories like this, my fans often point out canon explanations that were opaque to me before they pointed it out, smiley face. The residual shielding sounds even better than the rule of cool. And cool dude 22 Ping to commented that Ping told us what happened to Five's dad, but what happened to his mom, to which I replied, Now that's a question and a half. The fact that she is never mentioned is very, very telling. And something Jerry said is bothering me. She said his father's best choice was choosing to raise Five. Now that is odd phrasing. When a man and a woman are happily married, no one ever uses the word choice when describing the situation. That means there was something wrong with the relationship between Five's father and wherever Five's came from. Either Five's mother abandoned Five, went missing, or... or or Fives has no mother, and given the nature of the show, a child being produced with no mother is possible. Given that his father worked for Hanobi, perhaps Five was a stolen Hanobi project. To which Dan Mulatto kind of framed me in by responding. But before he responded, Cool Dude went on, no offense, but that's preposterous. Everybody has a mother at home. Point at some point, and Five and his dad have similar traits. To which I responded, not the slightest offense taken. To speculate on fiction is to make oneself preposterous, but this is a fictional world like Star Trek, and Data shared a lot of similar traits to Dr. Soon. It is very common for creators to craft their creations in their own images. Rembrandt St. Rembrandt St. Paul was a self-portrait. Five's dad was one of the first creators at Hanobi. To which Cool Dude 22 responds, this show is nothing like Star Trek. To which I replied, I would disagree. Its tone is different, it is far more grounded, but both are speculative fiction that deal with artificial creatures that might or might not be considered life forms. To which Dan Milano put the lid on it all by saying, We know and have discussed it, but it has yet come up within the context of a story. So, according to Dan Milano, so Fives, the concept of Fives' mother has been discussed and decided, but has yet to come up in the context of the story. All right, that's it for this Dan Milano response video. If you want something to fill your time before his next show comes out, check the links in the description to get a copy of Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, a book of human absurdity and a short story, short story collection of science fiction, or break your heart with dying embers, dragons, aliens, and things that go boom in the night. The book from author Betty Adams, Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data, is a humorous look at human behavior through the eyes of aliens. This book is arranged in separate reports or essays, documenting the experiences with humanity through the lens of the aliens who have to interact with them. This anthology of short stories and vignettes from alien points of view highlights some of humanity's quirks we can all relate to. Author Betty Adams captures how strange and interesting humans can really be. This is a fun collection of stories you will really get a kick out of. Humans Are Weird, I Have the Data from author Betty Adams. Order your copy right now on Amazon.